choir said, it's time to praise him. We're here this morning to praise the Lord. Not because we've been so good, but because he's been so great. And we thank him. Those that are with us this morning, here worshiping, those that are listening in the virtual audience, it's time to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's time to praise him, church. Raise your hands and praise the Lord. comes from Psalm 150. The choir's already introduced it. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts, church. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord this morning.
breakthrough coming your way. Has anyone had a breakthrough lately? Amen. Has anybody had a breakthrough where the move of God was truly on the way? Has there ever been a time in your life when you prayed for something for so long and you thought it would never happen and then God moved and it happened when you least expected it? Might it have been a mighty move of God was on the way. God bless you, Beacon Light. God is still moving. He is still rescuing. He is still restoring. He is still mending. He is still providing. He is still blessing. He is still protecting. He is still providing. A mighty move is on the way if you think God has forgotten you just wait I say on the Lord because it just might not be your time a mighty move of God is on the way you know my brothers and sisters for the last number of weeks we have looked at the I am Revelations are statements found in the book of John. And we're finished with those statements, but I want to continue on in the 15th chapter of John, if it's okay, to this share a little bit more that God has revealed to me. So today we're coming from the 15th chapter of John, Starting at the 12th verse, which reads, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. For our topic today, we will stay with no greater love. No greater love. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. I thank you, Father, for just blessing me with the opportunity to be present before your people one more time, Father. I thank you, Lord. And Lord, as I attempt to preach your message, I pray that you be with me and empower me, Father. And just open the eyes and hearts of those and ears of those listening that they might hear what thus saith the Lord. Yes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. A few weeks ago, he was talking about the vine and the vine dresser. Where Jesus, in the fifth verse of chapter 15, he's talking about his relationship to those who believe in him. And in that fifth verse in the 15th chapter, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So we talked about the vine. We talked about the fruit. We talked about the relationship between the vine and the branches. 
That was something else I teased Reverend Phillips about because a few weeks ago she preached about her mango tree and how it was still connected even though it was down. Two weeks ago I preached about the vine and she comes up last week and starts preaching about grapes. Amen? Amen. And, and her skills in growing things familiar to her home. But it goes on, and I want to go skip over to the ninth verse of chapter 15, which says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. No greater love. But this could also be titled, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. First point I want to lift up is that our relationship with Jesus will make our joy full. Amen. Will make our joy full. As you look at that 11th verse, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and your joy may be full. Our motivation is the love between God and Jesus that has been passed down to us. And therefore, because of that, our joy can be full. We can have the joy of Jesus. Remember the song, I got joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Joy is the state of delight and well-being that results from knowing mm -hmm. and serving God. It is good to know people. It is better to know God. Yeah, yes. And it is even greater for God to know you. What is life like without joy? It is painful when there is no joy. I turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus something that will be incomprehensible to us, to hang on a cross, to be tortured, to be pierced, and to die thy, that type of death was a joy to Jesus. Why was it a joy to Jesus? Because he knew that he was doing the will of his father. Amen. And he knew that his death would be that substitute death for us, Amen. so that we could have life Amen. eternal. Amen. Joy Amen. is what happens when you look at the greater good and not just mm -hmm. at yourself. Amen. Even in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it tells us that one of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, fruit, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. But you know, we like to have joy. But there is a thief out there who specializes in stealing our Joy. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I'm so glad that beyond that, there's another part of that verse that says, I have come that they may have life and they might have it more abundantly. We have abundant life because of the joy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the fullness of our joy. I read a quote and I forgot who said it. Somebody famous long ago. 
But our relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. is only as good as we allow ourselves to get close to him. As long as we allow him into our lives and have that intimate relationship with him, our joy can be full. We move on to the 12th verse where it says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And the point I want to lift up from that is there is no greater love than the love we have in this relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, as we begin to talk about love, I dare say that the English language is inadequate to be able to express the different types of love that is used in the Bible. You know, when we read the Bible, we might see love and we interpret what that love means based off of what we think love is. But there's actually three types of Greek words that are used for love in the New Testament. It is eros is one, that's that physical and romantic type of love. Filio is another type, it's friendship and warm affections for one another, it's close friendships. And then agape is the sacrificial, unconditional love of God. And this text, this text reminds us or refers to that agape type of love. With a little portion of that filial, that friendship type of love. So when Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Yes. We have to remember the price that he paid right. with his love yes. Yes. for us. But as we look at this, what struck out to me, he said, this is my commandment. This was not a suggestion. This was not a recommendation. But this was a command to love one another. We all have been in the workplace. And we know the difference when the authorities higher than us give us a suggestion, a recommendation, they are telling us from their wisdom something that they think we might want to do a different ways. But we know when they give us a commandment, there is no interpretation on our part that we are expected to fulfill that order, to fulfill that commandment. So Jesus is saying, this is my commandment. This is not optional as a child of God. You love one another. He's talking about the relationship between each other, between us. That's right. That's right. In the previous verses, verses 1 through 10, he talks about the relationship between himself and the believers. Now he's talking about the relationship among ourselves who have this common thread of a relationship with Jesus Christ. You are to love one another. That's that mutual love. Love as I have loved you. This is the standard. I dare say that is a high standard. That is a high bar to do. And believe it or not, in high school, I participated in track. And you wouldn't know by looking at me, but one of my events was the high jump. I could jump my height back then. I don't think I could do that anymore. But every now and then, we would be at a meet, and somebody would jump like 6'1 or something or 6'2. Or and I would look at that bar and just shake my head because I knew that I could not achieve that height. 
no matter what shoes I was wearing. I could have had PF flyers. I could have had pro kids. I could have had Converse. I could have had spikes in my shoes, but there was no way without a lift that I would have reached that bar. And it was okay to just shake your head and pass. I settled for third place in many a meet because I had some hops back in the day. But I knew when I saw the bar that I could not do that by myself, my brothers and sisters. The bar for love has been set high. Yes, yes it has. Preach. And we do not have the capabilities within ourselves mm -hmm. to reach that without the help of God. We do not have the capacity to reach that bar, to love like that, without Jesus in our hearts. As I have loved you, think about that. That's the way he wants us to love one another. And then he goes on to the 13th verse and says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Lay down his life for his friends. That's a high bar. You know, every summer we hear reports of people in lakes or the ocean getting in trouble while they're swimming and and if it's children, you will hear about parents who will jump in and save them. But I know at least twice this summer, I've heard reports of the children being saved, but the parent drowning. That parent didn't hesitate to jump in because that was their child. That was their baby. It is sad when this happens. And we try to put ourselves in that parent's place knowing that we would have done the same thing. That's greater love. But I ask the question, would a friend do the same? And may I suggest to you right now that there is a difference between good and greater love. You see, good love allows us to help somebody with conditions. But greater love allows us to love unconditionally. Now, I just, Sister Civil and I just returned from Colorado earlier this week, the family's home. And I met with my brother who lives out there. And we have not had the best relationship for 37 years. And every time I return, I have a desire to fix things. Amen? But there are some things out of our control. So years ago, I gave it over to God. I dare say that I had the best conversations with my brother that I had had in 37 years. We laughed and we joked and we talked and we didn't have to guard our conversations trying to deflect from pissing somebody off. Let me be honest. I know I'm not the only one who has somebody in their family that you have to tiptoe around because what you say might set them off. They might not speak to you for a long time. But I realized one of the reasons I was able to have this relationship because I I, I, I gave it over to God. That's that unconditional, that God who can make things happen. 
a move of God is on the way. The God that can restore relationships and make things better. Instead of us trying to fix it. Sometimes we have to do that. Amen. You see, good love will enable you to throw a life preserver to one in danger, while greater love will empower you to jump into the water and pull your loved one to safety. Good love will make you call 911 when your coworker is being attacked on an Alabama boat dock, but greater love enables you to jump into the water and swim to offer assistance. You know, there is a difference between good and greater love. There's a song we remember, the gospel song, No Greater Love. Our choir will sing it occasionally. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The son gave his life for me when he died on Calvary. There is no greater love, no love, nowhere, no greater love that a man would lay down his life for a friend. No love, nowhere. I've searched all over are the lyrics from the song. The greater love. Growing up in a military family, my father was in the Air Force. And we'd go on temporary duty. He would never tell us exactly where he was going. And I know one reason is because loose lips sink ships. Some of you might remember who are old enough. That was a slogan during World War II. I wasn't old enough, but I read about it. Amen. But he would go on temporary duty for six months or so and say, I'm going to Southeast Asia. And that's all we knew. So I was keen to keep up with military news and activities in Southeast Asia. And that, as a young boy, I discovered that a place called Vietnam was in Southeast Asia. But in my research and reading, I read everything I could find. I'd go to the library and read, read, and read. And I remember I came across a story about an airman who was a para-rescue person. Those are the ones that they send down in helicopters and they lower down to rescue soldiers in trouble and airmen who are in trouble. And I don't know why this stuck out with me. But actually, I know why now, but I didn't know then. But the name of the individual, the memorial I read was an airman named William Pitsenbarger. The name's not that important, but what he did was important. And this airman, he was awarded the Medal of Honor, one of the highest awards that a soldier can get for heroic actions on the battlefield. He was only 21 years old. And let me tell you what this report said that he did. It said that there was a group of soldiers who under heavy attack in Vietnam. Several were wounded, so they sent two helicopters to rescue the wounded. Now, there was no place to land, so the helicopters had to hover over the battle and lower baskets down to retrieve the wounded. And this airman, William Pissenbarger, he was the one who went down in the basket with his medical bag. He was the one who patched up soldiers. He was the one who assisted soldiers and put them in the baskets until the two helicopters were loaded up with wounded individuals. He chose to stay down on the battlefield instead of going back up in the helicopter. And he waited until the helicopter took those soldiers 
back to the aid station, to the camp. And then the helicopters returned. And there was an expectation that more would be lifted up. And Airman Pissenbarger would be one of them. But the helicopters started taking on heavy fire. The enemy was shooting at the helicopters and they, they decided that they could not stick around any longer. So they urged Pissenbarger to jump into the basket so they could take him away. His job was done to safety, but he put a wounded soldier in the basket and waved the basket off and said, y'all go on, I'm staying down here. He stayed with them and he aided soldiers. He made bandages and, 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 and slings and took leaves and stuff and bark to make braces for soldiers who was wounded. He stayed with them. And then he took up his rifle and started fighting with them. This individual who went way beyond his job in saving troops was mortally wounded. And he died on the battlefield with those soldiers. After this, he received the Airman's Cross, which was a high honor to receive in the Air Force. Even though his commander recommended him for the Medal of Honor, but they said that there's not enough information. So the men he saved, they lobbied and talked to their Congress people. And they made a great fuss and made the military take down their account since there wasn't enough information. So they took down their accounts of those who survived. And it is referred to the fact that his actions, Pissenbarger's actions, saved over 60 men during that battle. And in 2000, he died in 67. In 2000, he was awarded. His father accepted his Medal of Honor. Now I say all this because this impacted me as a boy to hear about this man who had greater love. So much so that he sought to do his duty at his own risk. Individuals in the battlefield, they weren't even his friends. He did not know them by name, but he knew that they needed his assistance. My brothers and my sisters, greater love is difficult to achieve on our own merit. Yes. We have good love, but greater love can only be achieved if there's something inside of us yes. that makes us know that I am only as good as I am to my fellow man, regardless of their race, regardless of their creed, regardless of their color, regardless of who they are and how they've treated me, regardless of how they think about me. Yeah. I will give my life so that others may be saved. Amen. And if you ever want to see a serviceman cry, Listen to them as they talk to you about somebody who saved their life, who is no longer here. I used to work with Vietnam vets as a teenager, and they were broken people because they could not get over the fact that someone else died for them so that they could live. No greater love. No greater love. Let me read that verse again, 13. Greater love has no one than this. Then he laid down one's life for his friends. For his friends. Abraham was called a friend of God. 
And look at verse 14. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And that's my next point. Because of his love, we are his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. How many times have we made friendship conditional? Y'all remember it starts off as children. I like you if you like me. I'll be your friend if you be my friend. Anybody pass those notes in class? Our friends. Abraham was called a friend of God because he obeyed God. Abraham and God communicated with each other. My friend, give their life. Lay down their life for his friends. Lay down his life for his friends. Verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you a servant and a friend. There are differences. A servant might clean the house but not live in the house. A friend is invited to stay in the house. You see, a servant might cook the meal but cannot eat at the master's table. A friend is welcome at the table anytime. A servant does what they are told to without understanding the mind of the master. A friend spends time explaining in detail their intentions. They will even draw a diagram if they have to. A servant will not be privy to the plans of the master, but a friend receives details of the plans. You see, friends recognize each other when they see one another. You can see somebody you haven't run into in 20 or 30 years and you will recognize them. That's what friends are. Yep, that's true. Years ago, I visited a local garden with some of our former church members. Remember Tim and Yvonne Carter? And, 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 and Yvonne wanted to hone her photography skills. So I, I said, Yvonne, y'all come out with me and I'll, I'll show you something. And I was sharing my approach to, to photographing flowers. And I was bent down at a certain angle. And a young man approached us. And he asked, aren't you Clarence Burke? Now, when people say that to me, sometimes I have to struggle to recollect when our paths might have crossed. Because I did not recognize this individual. Was this somebody I knew years gone by? Was this... Somebody who possibly was a relative? Was this somebody who heard about me somewhere else? He said, I am your Facebook friend, and I admire your photography. So, you know, and I said this, my brothers and sisters, because some of us have gotten this twisted. And we think our relationships are based off of what's happening on social media. And that's what's happening in real life. Just because we can read a tweet, just because we can laugh at a funny caption, just because we keep up with certain individuals based on what they post in social media does not make them our friends. I dare say reach out to those types of friends and tell them you need $20 and see who answers. Tell them you haven't had a hot meal in days and 
see who hap what happens and who shows up with a hot meal. You might have a few, but most will use their finger and scroll right past that post looking for something more interesting. What I'm trying to say is there are some folks who think they have a relationship with God. But they are like those social media friends. Does God really know them? Do they have a real relationship with him? Or just because you went to Sunday school as a child and have memorized half a dozen scripture does not make you a friend of God. Just because you cracked open the Bible in the drawer of a hotel room once upon a time does not make you a friend of God. Just because you accepted that Bible in the baccalaureate line as you graduated from school does not make you a friend of God. I don't know if y'all even do baccalaureates anymore. But that was big back in my day. Each graduate got a Bible, and inside it said, from the Gideons. I had to look up and see who the Gideons were. But they were a group who were devoted to passing on the message and sharing the message of Jesus Christ. The friend, he is calling us friends. And because we are friends, we are to keep his commandment, to love one another. He is calling us friends because all things he has heard from the Father, he has shared with us. Many of us has had mentors, whether it's in the workplace or in school, some would share with us everything they knew to make us better. Those were good mentors. But then we had other mentors who were trying to protect their turf, who wouldn't share enough with us, hid things from us, wanted themselves to look better than to see us shine. But Jesus was the kind of mentor that shared it all. Jesus was the kind of mentor who shared everything that God had provided to him, did not hold back. Jesus was the good mentor. And he goes in the 16th verse of John 15. You did not choose me. Wait a minute, Lord, I thought I chose you. No, 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 don't get it twisted. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Another reference to the vine. That you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he gives to you. You see, it was common practice during those times for the students to choose their teachers. It was common practice for the disciples to choose their teachers. But Jesus reminds them that he chose them. It's interesting that he chose them. He chose the disciples. And among the disciples, he chose the ones that will be apostles. That's right. Let's look at Luke chapter 6 for a moment. Verse 12 says, Now when it come to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. Yeah. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. So Jesus is saying, I chose you for this mission. 
I chose you for this mission. Now, as I reflected on this, I found it interesting who Jesus chose. You see, as you look at this, we only know with absolute surety the occupation of five of the twelve. We know that Andrew, Peter, James, John were fishermen. We know that Matthew was a tax collector. But of the other seven, we don't know what they did. Jesus, what qualifications did they have to be named apostles? Employers go to great lengths to find the right candidates for job openings. Jesus did not have to go to LinkedIn. Jesus did not have to go to ZipRecruiter to find them. He did not have to post an ad in the paper with qualifications. There was no interview. I dare say that if we had to choose disciples, we probably would have done it differently. We would have looked at different elements of their lives and chosen differently. We might have chosen people with influence. We might have chosen people who could do something for us. We might have chosen people who could have enriched our pocketbooks. We might have chosen somebody who was strong in certain areas that we were weak in. But Jesus chose fishermen and made them fishers of men. He chose them, and he empowered them to multiply his message. He appointed them that you should go and bear fruit, as it says in 15, and that your fruit should remain. Matthew 28, verse 18, the great commandment, great commission says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Since Jesus would be with them to the end, they knew that they could do what he asked them to do. He tells them that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. That's love. That's love. That's love. Many of these apostles gave their life for the cause of God because they ran into individuals that didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Some of them were beheaded. Some were put in prison. Paul, who became an apostle later, was in prison, gave us a successful life as a Pharisee to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And in verse 17, he says, These things I command you, that you love one another. That you love one another. And in conclusion, I'll say, share a passage with you from 2 Samuel about David. As we look at 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, David and his mighty men were in battle with the Philistines. Philistines. And the Philistines controlled essentially Bethlehem. And David and his men were camped away. And I will start at the 15th verse of 2 Samuel 23. It says, And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Brought it to David. 
David wished for something so bad that three of his soldiers risked their life to cross enemy lines and go to get the water that he longed for. That is greater love. But look at what happened to David. They brought it to David. And in that 16th verse, it says, nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. In other words, what David is saying, I am pouring this water out as an offering to you, Lord, because of what you have done for me. Yes, I desired that water, that sparkling water, that clean water that comes from the well by the gate of Bethlehem. But I did not think that when I said that, that I had individuals who followed me, who were under my command, that had greater love for me than for themselves. I did not command them to do it. It was a suggestion. It was a thought. But yet they took it upon themselves to take their spears, to take their shield, to take their swords, to go commando and sneak across enemy lines knowing that their lives were in danger to bring back the water I desired. And because of their love is so great, I am not worthy of drinking this water. Therefore, Lord, I pour this out as a sacrifice to you. Greater love. Greater love. Three men were willing to sacrifice their lives to fulfill David's desire. Greater love. Greater love. Also in that song, No Greater Love, some of the lyrics say Jesus went to Calvary to save a wrench like you and me. That's love. That's love. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. They hung his head. He hung his head for me. He died. That's love. That's love. But that's not how the story ends. For three days later, he rose again. That's love. He loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for us so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's love. No greater love than to be willing to lay his life for his friends. Jesus set the standard. Jesus raised the bar. It's up to us to be obedient to him and follow his commands. It's up to us to help those around us. It's up to us to feed the hungry, the clothed, the naked, the visit to in prison. It's up to us to do these things. It's up to us to provide for those who don't have. It's up to us to share instead of big and building bigger barns. It's up to us. It's up to us. No greater love. God bless you. No greater love.